Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation Ask the Ask Expert webinar. I am Mike Knoppen, the Program Director of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. Today's Ask the Expert webinar will relate to DM and palliative care. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. Our vision is a world with treatments and a cure for myotonic dystrophy. Our mission is community, care, and a cure. We support and connect the myotonic dystrophy community. We provide resources and advocate for care. And we accelerate research toward treatments and a cure. MDF is proud to provide resources and support to community members. A few of those resources are listed on your screen now. You can find our toolkits and publications, including important clinical care guidelines that individuals can give to their providers to ensure the best possible care at myotonic.org slash toolkits dash publications. You can find support programs, including local support groups, virtual support groups, and special interest community groups at myotonic.org slash find dash support. And you can find events like this one, our support groups, and many others at our calendar of events at myotonic.org slash calendar slash month. And you can watch videos recorded like this one and many past videos at our digital academy at myotonic.org slash digital dash academy. This webinar is part of a series of Ask the Expert webinars, and you can find past and future series at uh, myotonic.org slash ask dash expert dash series, and you can register for our next in the series, which will take place in August, and that Ask the Expert will be related to disability rights, future planning, and special needs with a disability rights attorney. So we hope you can join us then. Another great series in our education webinars is the Meet the DM Drug Developer Sessions. These take place on the first Fridays of months at noon Pacific, and we're very pleased to announce that Harmony Biosciences will be uh, a special guest on July 22nd, so not the first Friday, but later this month, uh, next week, and in August on the first Friday, PepGen. Uh, these are great opportunities for you to learn about drug developers and what they are doing in the space and to ask your questions. So you can register for those events and submit questions in advance at myotonic.org slash meet dash DM dash drug dash developers. The 2022 MDF annual conference is planned and we are excited to uh, invite you to join us. It will take place on September 9th and 10th. Registration is now open. Uh, be sure to register now and book your rooms. We hope that many folks will be able to come and participate in person. It will be our first in-person conference in several years, and we hope to see many of you there. The room discount ends on August 8th. There will be five tracks at the conference this year, one for DM1, DM2, Juvenile Onset Adults, or JOA, Caregivers and Self-Care, and a track for researchers, scientists, and clinicians in our professionals track. Some of the session topics include symptom management, research, rights, exercise, grief management, and more. You can register now and learn more about the conference and its uh, many wonderful features this year at myotonic.org slash 2022-MDF dash annual dash conference. And now I am very pleased to introduce our expert today, Dr. Shauna Gibbons. Dr. Gibbons is an assistant professor of medicine in the division of palliative medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Her current work focuses on expanding ambulatory palliative medicine at the University of Kansas Health System to serve a wider range of serious illnesses, including pulmonary and neurological diseases. She's a core faculty member in the Internal Medicine Residency Program with a focus in diversity, equity, and inclusion. She received her medical degree from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, 
then completed an internal medicine residency and palliative medicine fellowship at the University of Kansas. In her spare time, she enjoys painting, cooking, and enjoying the outdoors with her husband and her dog. We're very pleased to be able to invite Dr. Gibbons to speak and share a little bit about palliative medicine and to invite you to ask her questions. You can ask questions throughout the broadcast. Here's a couple of ways to do that. If you're using a desktop device to engage today, you can open the questions tab and type your question and click send. We'll answer questions toward the end of the presentation. If you're using a smartphone, you can click on the question mark icon at the top of the screen, type your question, and click send. A number of individuals also included questions during their registration, and we will address those in the Q&A as well. If today's program speaks to you, please consider showing your appreciation and support of the MDF with a donation. Together, we will change the future of myotonic dystrophy. You can donate to MDF at myotonic.org slash donate. And now it is my great pleasure and privilege to invite Dr. Shawna Gibbons to speak to us about DM and palliative care. Dr. Gibbons, welcome. Hi, thank you so much, Mike. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Okay, everything look okay on your end? Looks fantastic, Dr. Gibbons. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, before we get started, I'd just like to say that I am just so excited and honored to be talking to you all um, and share a little bit about what I do and hopefully answer some of your questions about palliative medicine and how it might be helpful to you. So thank you so much for having me. Um, so just a brief overview of what I hope you guys will take away from this talk. Um, I want to talk about what palliative medicine is and what it is not, talk about who and when palliative medicine can help, and then finally talk about the evidence for palliative medicine as a really integral part of comprehensive patient-centered medical care. So what is palliative medicine? Well, at the most basic level, it's a subspecialty of medicine. So kind of like cardiology, internal medicine, neurology, all of those things. Palliative medicine um, is a field in which doctors and nurses have extra training and expertise. For me, I did my internal medicine residency. And instead of stopping there, I did an extra year of a palliative medicine fellowship. Um, and so it's just an extra... Um, training that I have in um, palliative medicine. The other important thing to know is that as far as medical subspecialties go, it's actually relatively new. Um, so the, the term palliative care was first coined in 1974. Um, and it wasn't until 1987 that the United States got its first palliative medicine fellowship and inpatient palliative service at the Cleveland Clinic Cancer Center. Despite the fact that it's relatively new, in the last decade, there's been lots and lots of progress um, and lots of expansion of palliative medicine. And now 90% of hospitals that have over 300 beds have some sort of palliative medicine service. So it's expanded quite a lot for being um, a field that's relatively new. This is a definition from the Center for Advancement of Palliative Care, and it kind of gets to the core of what we do. It's specialized medical care for people living with serious illnesses with the aim of providing relief from symptoms and stress from the disease. So really what we do is we prioritize the patient as a whole, and that includes um, really thinking about family and support systems as well, and advocating for that patient's goal, whatever that might be. Palliative care is delivered by a team of doctors, nurses, and social workers. We do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, when you're talking about taking care of the whole person, you know, doctors have certain expertise, like I know a lot about medicines and things like that, but I rely on social workers on my team all the time to help make sure that my patients have access to the resources they need um, and the care that they need outside of the clinic setting in the hospital. The main pillars of palliative medicine are symptom management and quality of life, 
psychosocial, spiritual support and um, connection to resources. And then complex decision making, help with complex decision making and goals of care. A key palliative tenant is that a person's goals of care should drive the plan of care. So that way patients and their families, they're getting the medical care that they want because that can differ from individual to individual. So we help explore that. So it's very normal to have misconceptions about palliative medicine. And in fact, I would say it is the norm. Um, it's a relatively new field, like um, I mentioned before. And even though it's grown a whole lot, a lot of people aren't familiar with it. In fact, a study from 2000, um, from 2021, so just last year, showed that 70% of the general population were unfamiliar with palliative medicine. Compare that to hospice, which most people were familiar with, 85% of people. Not only that, among that small group of people who did know what palliative medicine was, more than half of them thought that it was just end-of-life care or the same as hospice, which isn't the case. I'll talk about some of the differences here because I think it's really important for us to, to touch on. So palliative medicine is appropriate for anyone with a serious illness to help with symptoms, planning, communication, even if their goals are aggressive and still, um, and they still intend to pursue aggressive medical management, which is very different than hospice, where the goal is to focus on comfort um, and not so much, you know, treat aggressive treatment. So hosp unlike hospice, palliative medicine is done simultaneously with disease-directed treatment. So for example, if a patient has cancer, let's say, um, Actually, many of the people we see are cancer patients who are still getting chemotherapy. They're still wanting to be aggressive about their treatment, but they have the involvement of palliative medicine to help with symptom management, particularly things like complex pain, nausea, anxiety, all of those things, and to help with um, complex decision making. The palliative care team does not replace your other doctors. They work in tandem with your other doctor. So your neurologist and your general practitioner, all of those doctors, we're just an extra doctor and team that has a different specialty. So we work with them and often communicate with them to get their expertise to help inform our care as well. Palliative medicine is not dependent on prognosis, unlike hospice. And it can be done at any stage of the illness, not just end of life. So kind of to sum that all up, palliative medicine is based on need, not prognosis or age. So what does it mean to need palliative care? Well, before we touch on that, I want to just kind of take a second to talk about a really special part of um, the myotonic dystrophy community, which is that it is incredibly diverse, and this is from the Christopher Project, uh, project from 2019. The age of diagnosis, disease severity, and trajectory, there's such a wide range of that amongst the myotonic dystrophy community that the need for palliative medicine may vary very significantly from individual to individual. So I think that's really important. And at the end of the day, you are an expert in your own body. So what I tell folks is to, you know, if you have any questions about is palliative medicine something I might need after talking, after going through this talk, go ahead and ask your neurologist or your, your PCP. Um, they may have some more familiar, familiarity with resources in your area and help talk through some of those things. So as far as kind of um, signals for a need or a, a high need for palliative medicine, so if you're at home, um, an increasing symptom burden um, that is more and more difficult to manage, particularly things like shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, those symptoms that are really hard to manage at home and getting worse, um, that might signal a need for palliative involvement. Frequent visits to the hospital or the emergency, emergency department, a declining functional status, so Things are suddenly getting much worse or harder to do at home than they had been in the past. And caregiver burnout. Things are just getting harder for your support team, and, and it's a struggle to get the care you need at home. 
if you happen to be admitted to the hospital, we have palliative care services in the hospital as well. And things that might signal need for us to be involved in that setting are something like the need for help with complex medical decision making. Lots of times patients and families end up in the hospital seeing multiple doctors, multiple teams, getting mixed messages, and then at the end of the day being asked, okay, so now what do you want to do? That would be hard for anybody to sort through. Part of our role is to help with that kind of decision making in the, hos in the hospital um, and to communicate with all of those different teams to make sure your questions are being asked and answered and to help with decision making. If there are complex psychosocial situations um, that need help in the hospital, if there are complex or if there's a big change in prognosis or function, for instance, if something acute has happened um, in a hospitalization that's going to change how much time you have or what that time might look like, we can get involved and help talk through that and see what resources are, are there for you when you do come out of the hospital. Or if you have poorly managed symptoms in the hospital, we can help with that too. So these things signal an urgent need for palliative medicine, but there's a lot of evidence to show that the earlier we get involved in um, patient care, uh, the more beneficial we are. So this is, um, this is a, a chart from the New England Journal of Medicine, and it kind of shows um, two different approaches to when to start palliative medicine. So the, the top bar here, it's kind of the traditional approach where palliative care gets involved right at the end stages of a disease after quality of life has really declined um, already. Um, the evidence so far has shown, though, that earlier involvement, similar to the bottom bar graph, um, is actually more beneficial in terms of quality of life for the patient, um, help with uh, get, getting looked into resources, and even in some cases, increasing survival for patients too. The earlier we're involved, the better that care is. So where is palliative care done? It's really across all settings. So at home, you may have heard of something called palliative home health. What that is, is it's similar to traditional home health, but you get the additional support of a, a nurse um, or a nurse practitioner who really focuses on symptom management and will report back to your docs about if there needs to be any changes. But other than that, it's essentially the same as traditional home health. In the clinic, much of palliative medicine is actually done in the clinic for cancer patients. Um, we have a pretty big cancer center here at uh, the University of Cancer and a very big presence in our palliative clinic. Um, that's actually part of the requirement to be designated as a center of excellence for, from the National Cancer Institute is having palliative clinics and palliative care involved. But unfortunately, there's uh, a big gap in care for folks with neuromuscular disease, the clinics available that serve that patient population is far more rare. But what we do in the cancer center, for instance, is we help with symptom management, um, it, mostly pain management, help with decision making and things like that for folks who are getting cancer treatment in our center. I'm currently working with our neurology team to try to grow our palliative program and have those resources available for people with neuromuscular diseases and movement disorders. So that's, that's something that we're working on at KU right now. And then lastly, palliative medicine is done in the hospital. This is mostly what I do right now. Um, it, if you've ever been admitted to the hospital, you know, you see cardiologists, infectious disease doctors, all of those folks come in to give their expertise. That's the same role that we have in the hospital and we help with, um, as I said before, symptom management and complex decision making, things like that. So what are the big things that we actually do in palliative medicine? So what I would like to call this the pillars of palliative care are symptom management, social, emotional, and practical support, and then talking about advanced care planning and complex uh, decision making. And we'll get a little bit into all of these three pillars here in the next couple of slides. So symptom management. 
Patients with uh, neuromuscular diseases suffer from quite a heavy symptom burden, but unfortunately there is a lack of data on their experience um, and the best ways to treat that symptom. So pain, shortness of breath, secretion management, myotonia or weakness, GI disturbances, sleep disturbance, poor appetite, all of those things are experienced by people with um, myotonic dystrophy. Um, a, a study in 2017 said um, that up to 87 or 78% of people with neuromuscular disease have chronic pain that tends to worsen over time. Despite this, there is a pretty big lack of evidence-based recommendations as to how to treat this pain in specific. And I think that's a really um, good area for our team to try to help grow and improve that gap in care. Um, shortness of breath, that's another interesting one too. Uh, there's been studies that show that shortness of breath is experienced similarly with folks who have neuromuscular disease compared to primary pulmonary disease like COPD. It's just as distressing, but there's also some evidence to show that neuromuscular disease, when you have that added symptom of shortness of breath, there is more of a component of anxiety and worry about the future that uh, is not so much present in folks with primary pulmonary disease. So there's just a lot of complex symptom management needs that I think we would be well equipped to help with. So I just want to touch a little bit more on the symptom of pain, just to give you all an example of how we as palliative care docs approach pain that might be different to other pain doctors. We, like everything, look at a patient's care as a holistic experience. So when you talk about pain, a person's experience of pain, that's physical pain and non-physical pain. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that treating both of those aspects is the way to get the best pain control. So when we talk about looking at the physical pain component of it, we would do a comprehensive pain assessment, try to figure out is this pain visceral, somatic, neuropathic, to try to pinpoint the right medication that might help with that pain. But then on the other hand, we also really want to focus on psychological factors, uh, social stressors, spiritual or existential distress that also contribute to a person's experience of pain. And that way we really approach things in a holistic manner to ensure that we're getting um, the best possible symptom management. Social and emotional support is also something that we really uh, prioritize in palliative medicine. So some of those things that we're trained to talk about would be coping with functional or cognitive decline, connecting families with practical resources, especially with the help of our palliative trained social work colleagues. We really will rely on them to help with uh, you know, counseling support, equipment support, things like that, caregiver support and respite. Um, and then just addressing the psychological, social, and spiritual aspects of living with a serious illness, which we know are all very important parts of uh, comprehensive patient care. This way, you know, we're not just caring for or treating the disease, we're really kind of focusing on the whole person. So that third pillar of palliative care that we talked about, advanced care planning and complex decision making. This is something that's really important, um, not only for people with serious illnesses, but really for everybody. Um, advanced care planning is basically learning about the types of decisions that might need to be made regarding healthcare, considering those decisions ahead of time, and then letting others know, your family, your healthcare providers, people who are important to you, know about your preferences. So, a review, a, a pretty large review of patients and caregivers with neuromuscular diseases found the following themes that a voice in decision making is very important for patients. Planning for the future is also a very important um, thing for them and um, a source of anxiety as well, um, not having a plan for the future. Maintaining control and dignity for as long as possible is very important. And being able to educate healthcare providers in their community, especially in case of emergencies. So patients who have access to advanced care planning and have done those things to have 
discussions with family and their healthcare providers beforehand, before an emergency situation, studies have shown that that leads to a feeling of more control and that it helps pre preserve patient autonomy, which is very important, and that it helps ensure patients get the care that they want and don't get the type of care that they don't want. So what, what are the nuts and bolts of advanced care planning? So things like durable powers of attorney. As doctors, we really just deal with durable power of attorney for healthcare, not financial or anything like that. Um, and I'll talk more about DPOAs on the next slide. Advanced directives. This is just basically going through, hey, what things would you want and what would you not want for your medical care? Discussions of safety nets and decision making. So some things we might talk through, um, and again, these are conversations that are best had before you need to have them, before an emergency setting. And we take the time to talk through these things with, with our patients. Pacemakers and defibrillators, what questions do you have about them? Are they right for you? Are they going to help? Um, what happens if I don't want it later? Things like that. Um, talking about breathing machines, feeding tubes, preferences for care during an acute illness, having discussions about things like resuscitation, ventilators, big surgeries, and then also quality of life non-negotiables. What is a quality of life that is important that you preserve? All of these things, talking about them early, protects autonomy and ensures goal concordant care. And it also gives family peace of mind, knowing that we have a plan um, in the case that we do need a plan. So just to, to give you guys a little bit more insight on what a DPOA looks like, this is an example of a form uh, for Kansas specifically. There are different forms for different states, but they all kind of look the same. So power of attorney, um, basically what it is, is you as the patient, get to appoint somebody that you trust as an agent or a surrogate decision maker if for whatever reason you can't make decisions yourself. As long as you can make decisions yourself, this does not apply. But if there is a serious illness where for whatever reason you can't talk for yourself, this basically is a document that says this is who I want to talk to because they know what I want. A good agent can be anybody, it doesn't have to be family, um, but anybody who will speak for you in your wishes, even if it might be something they disagree with. Again, it only becomes active if you aren't able to speak for yourself. For, the, for our purposes, this is just specified for healthcare decisions. If you want to do a financial power of attorney, that's a completely different um, form and usually involves a lawyer. This can be voided at any time. And again, it helps preserve patient autonomy, um, make sure that a patient's wishes are respected, and helps resolve conflict um, if that ever were to come up. So what does the data show about all of this? A lot of what we know is based on the integration of palliative care into cancer clinics, just because that's where it first started off and that's where we have the most data. So there is a whole lot of evidence that shows that early involvement, like we talked about earlier, of palliative care improves quality of life and mood. There's more documentation of patient wishes, improved symptom management, and even longer survival when added to standard of care, which I thought was very interesting. So for non-cancer illnesses, there's also been a lot of evidence to show benefit, particularly things like heart disease, COPD, um, things like that. There's uh, evidence of reduced hospitalizations, reduced emergency room visits, lower symptom burden, and improved documentation as well as improved satisfaction with communication. But what about myotonic dystrophy and neuromuscular disorder specifically? So like we talked about earlier, this is a place where I think there's a lot um, of room for growth. Um, the good news is that that's something that is becoming more of a priority, um, especially in the last five years. 
In 2017, a study of patients with neuromuscular disease showed that uh, there was a big desire for more information on what to expect for advanced care planning. Um, uncertainty was a big source of anxiety. They wanted more quality interaction with medical teams, more focus on addressing pain and other symptoms. In that same year, there was a, a, control, a randomized control trial that showed that palliative care intervention in this uh, patient population significantly improved quality of life, um, particularly when it comes to symptom management, like shortness of breath, pain, and GI issues. Um, referencing back to the Christopher report from 2019, uh, there's a huge gap in care for many patients with myotonic dystrophy. 21% um, of those patients surveyed were reported not getting any assistance at all at the time of their diagnosis. Um, in addition to reporting lots of the same issues with wanting more interaction with medical teams and focus on symptom management and support. Uh, so in short, there's room for growth. There's lots of potential and promising um, advancements in this area. Um, and I, I think that this is gonna be um, a really um, big area of growth for palliative medicine uh, to hopefully help improve patient care for folks with myotonic dystrophy and other neuromuscular disorders. If you all are interested in finding palliative care providers near you, um, getpalliativecare.org is a website where you can type in your location and it can connect you with, or it can show you what's available in your area. Um, they're all my references. Thank you guys so much for your attention, and I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Dr. Gibbons, thank you so much for that thorough and thoughtful presentation. We do indeed have a number of questions. The first that I will ask to you is... Uh, from one of our registrants who placed this question when they when they first registered, um, related to palliative care and primary care and the relationship between the two, uh, including whether or not palliative care replaces primary care. Yeah, that's such a great question, and it's such a common question too. Um, palliative care does not replace primary care. Um, we work hand in hand with primary care docs and neurology docs to make sure that uh, patient symptoms are managed and they have all the support they need. As far as my experience here at KU, a lot of times, you know, I, and I'm probably biased, our nurses are just so responsive and so wonderful that a lot of patients end up calling our palliative team um, for, for a lot of primary care issues, but it, we don't replace primary care docs or anything like that. We work together with them. Now, if you're talking about hospice in particular, hospice is kind of a different um, thing, and, and that is a service, a Medicare benefit, and because of the Medicare rules, that would replace primary care, or you would have to have your primary care doctor enroll with the hospice to become your hospice doctor, which a lot of people do. But as far as just palliative medicine, no, we do not replace primary care, and, and that continues on as you see us. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. Another question is, can you provide some guidance on how folks should sort of choose palliative care providers, what kinds of questions they should ask, or do you sort of have to go with whatever palliative care service is available? How should people think about um, choosing or finding or identifying and working with palliative care team? That's another great question. So I would, um, so I would first say the best resource is probably your uh, neurologist or your general practitioner to see if they have any resources within your institution. There's also that getpalliativecare.org website that you can just type in um, your location and find palliative care services nearby. Usually to get the comprehensive palliative care services that, that we would have, we would offer with the clinic doctor and nurses and support, those are usually at this point attached to big hospitals. 
Um, and so there's not usually a lot of just palliative care standalone clinics out in the community. If you are looking for palliative home health, um, that is, that's kind of a, a different um, service than a palliative care clinic. But if you're looking for palliative home health, all you would have to do is ask whatever social worker or case manager you work with, um, and they would be able to help you find those resources. Um, but I would, I would say, you know, start with the doctors and nurses you trust and see if they have any recommendations. Um, that website is helpful. It has a pretty extensive um, database and then whatever the hospital is is nearby the the bigger the hospital the more likely it is to have a full comprehensive palliative care uh, service thank you dr gibbons i know you spoke about this in your presentation but you could you elaborate on when someone should select palliative care i think you said a little bit about how it's sort of appropriate for any stage of chronic condition and earlier intervention is better, um, but could you help someone living with DM kind of think through when they should personally be asking about palliative care? Yeah, so and, and I think that this is one of the um, really important things that DM in particular, because, because there's so many different presentations and disease trajectories, it's so individual. So it's not necessarily like at this time you've had it for this long, this is when you need to get palliative. It's more dependent, I think, especially for DM based on symptoms um, and functional status. So I think that the biggest um, flags to signal palliative involvement might be helpful for you as somebody with DM is um, issues with shortness of breath, um, needing uh, help breathing, issues with trouble swallowing. That's another big one. Um, any kind of big functional decline if weakness is getting much worse and we're having and you're having to have a lot of extra care pretty rapidly. That's also uh, another um, another sign that palliative might be it might be a time to try to find a palliative, palliative doc. And then really frequent hospitalizations is another one I would say. So if you're getting hospitalized hospitalized like multiple times every couple every couple of months or so, I would say that might be a sign that hey, symptoms aren't well controlled. We need some extra support outside of the hospital. What can we do to help there? Um, so yeah, and, and again, age really doesn't matter. Um, you know, I'm not a pediatric doc, but we do have pediatric palliative care doctors, and they're wonderful. Um, and, and similarly, they really just are on board when we have a serious illness and a lot of symptom burden. So I would say rely more on how you're doing functionally, hospitalizations, and then some of those um, signal symptoms like shortness of breath, trouble swallowing, and then even lots of pain issues with pain too. Thank you very much. Another question relates more to communicating about palliative care with others. So one of our attendees asks, you know, what should I talk to my doctors and family about, about palliative care? Yeah, I think, and this is so, um, I think this is so important having the right language and the right words to talk about palliative care, um, because it can kind of be scary. And I just want to acknowledge that, especially there's so much, um, there's so much misconception about palliative care being hospice that it's easy to be kind of scared off from it. And I think it's it's kind of a shame because it's such a good support for people who need extra, extra help with symptom management. So I would just start by saying, you know, palliative, palliative care is an extra layer of support to help with quality of life, improving quality of life. Um, and that's really what we focus on is improving quality of life, be that through symptom management or be that through making sure that the medical care you're getting is the medical care you want. Um, and those would be the two things that I would focus on if you're trying to talk to your family or your doctors about it. And then also be really clear about what your goals are. And you might not know right away what your goals are, but it's it's important to kind of talk through that with your doctors, ask questions of your doctors, um, you know, depending on how you like to receive information. Some people like really clear cut, blunt information. Other people don't like that as much. 
communicate that with your doctor and say, hey, I want information about this so I can help make these decisions. I want to plan for the future. Um, and I, I wonder if palliative medicine might be helpful for that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I completely acknowledge that it can be kind of scary. And even I, I just did a cursory search on the internet. A lot of a lot of resources still use palliative and hospice interchangeably. And I think that that could be so confusing. Um, and that's a source of a lot of anxiety for folks who hear palliative, palliative care. But I would just kind of really focus in on the fact that those things are different and um, our role is an extra layer of support for whatever your goals are. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. I do want to take this opportunity to encourage any attendees who have questions. Now is your time. Go ahead and place your question in the question box for Dr. Gibbons and send that to us. We have a number of other questions to get through those, so I will ask Dr. Gibbons our next question. And this has more to do with um, a circumstance that one registrant shared about sort of getting resistance to requesting palliative care. They share that in an appointment with their primary care physician, they were told, you do not need that because we know more about the disease and we have an expert clinic nearby. What should someone do in that situation? Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think this kind of goes back to a lot of people, even a lot of doctors not being very familiar with palliative care and what we do. Um, because palliative care is not about having more expertise in the disease process. I see patients who have so many different types of diseases. There's no way that I can be you know, a cardiology expert or a cancer expert. And, and I know that that's not where my expertise lies. I would say, you know, it's not so much about being an expertise in the disease as much as being an expertise in the symptoms of that disease. Um, and, and, you know, if you're getting pushback, um, you, what I would say is that, well, I, I appreciate that expertise for the disease, but I, I would like to have some support for symptom management. And I really think that palliative care can help with that. Um, yeah, I, I rely on my, my colleagues all the time to get their input into their spaces of expertise. And I use that to help guide my decision making when it comes to the care that I get. And sometimes it really is just about, and it's, you know, it's unfortunate that you as a patient have to be in the position to um, advocate for yourself. But I would just encourage you, if that's something that you want to explore, to advocate for yourself, get a caregiver, a family member to help advocate for you. Um, and as far as having expert the uh, specialist centers nearby, a lot of the specialist centers require palliative care involvement for symptom management, going back to the Cancer Center of Excellence. Um, that, is, that is a requirement. Um, and so it's kind of, it's a piece to that puzzle. So I would say advocate for yourself um, if, if you do want to speak with a palliative doctor. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. That registrant was actually live with us and has reframed the question to help me understand it better, which is actually the reverse of that situation. What should someone do if they approach a palliative care expert who says, you don't need to see me, you need to see these other experts instead? What does that oh. situation look like? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So, you know, I would say as a palliative doctor, I have pointed people towards different experts, but I usually keep them as well. And um, because I, I kind of tackle different aspects of a disease, like the symptom management parts of it. So I wonder if um, I wonder if that might be a matter of the specific setup of palliative in that area. Some, again, because it's a pretty new subspecialty, a lot of areas don't have such a robust um, clinic setup, and they may not have the capacity to take on patients. Um, as far as complete comprehensive palliative care patients. So I wonder if that had something to do with it. Without speaking to the provider, I'm not, I, I can't be 100% sure, but I, I would guess it's that. Either that or that there's something else that that palliative provider um, 
found that needed um, expert management from a different specialist and that they would still be willing to stay on for symptom management. So that's what I, that's what I would say to that. And I hope that answered um, the question, but yeah, that's, that's something I, I'm kind of surprised that you ran into, but I'm also knowing how rare it is to have as big of a program as we have it would it would make sense that in some places that resource might not be as as strong as it is here. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. We have some more follow ups to that, but I want to make sure we cover everyone's questions. So I'd like to ask you now about um, insurance and mm -hmm. what we know about insurance, specifically whether Medicaid or Medicare cover palliative care services. Yeah, so um, if you are going to see a palliative care doctor in a clinic or in the hospital, Medicaid and Medicare would cover that. Um, so it, it's similarly to how they cover other um, subspecialty med medicine fields. Um, if you are talking about palliative home health, you would still have to meet the requirements for just basic home health, um, you know, essentially being homebound. Um, and then it would be covered. But as far as just clinic and in the hospital, that would be covered by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, if you're talking about hospice, that is completely covered by Medicare or private insurance. Um, and the benefits of hospice that are paid for by Medicare are quite a bit. So they pay for... Um, medications, uh, medical equipment, um, the doctor and nurse access, but that's hospice. When you talk about paying for insurance, paying for palliative care, it's really just that doctor visit, the doctor and nurse visit, not necessarily things like durable medical equipment and things like that, if that makes sense. So it sounds like you're saying the specific services, it may depend on which specific service is being applied through palliative care, and you'd have to check with your insurer to yeah, see what yeah. the coverage is for the specific service? I would definitely check with your insurer. Um, I know from working with our patient population, most of them have Medicaid and Medicare, and it's covered um, for clinic visits and hospital visits. Those sorts of things are covered. Thank you very much. We have another question related to sort of some specific um, symptom issues, mm -hmm. whether palliative care can do anything for individuals with, um, uh, particularly those with like extreme myotonia in their hands, or their hands are just, uh, it, they're having a lot of difficulty with, with their hands, whether palliative care would be able to offer any specific interventions for someone in that situation. Yeah, so um, as far as symptom management for myotonia, there's, again, unfortunately, not a whole lot of evidence um, for any specific uh, medications. There's one medication that I can think of, uh, mixolotine, that is used for myotonia with some um, fair amount of evidence for it helping. Um, mixolotine is something that it's also a cardiac medication. So if we were gonna start that medication, what I would do is get a cardiology doctor to see you as well, have them clear you to start that and then consider trying mixolatine. Now, again, the evidence is not, it's not going to completely um, get rid of the myotonia. It's, um, it, there's evidence that it kind of helps reduce it. Um, as far as other things I can think of, you know, talking to your case manager or social worker about any kind of assistive devices too, especially if you're having issues with your hands, um, may be helpful as well. Um, is that is that does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I, be I believe so. So it sounds like you're saying palliative care could be helpful in referring to other services, like maybe occupational therapy mm -hmm. or social work and, and other things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Um, and we we have, um, like I said, our, our multidisciplinary team works really closely with social work and all of those other um, uh, professionals like occupational therapy and things like that to help with um, the effects of myotonia. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. Um, could you say a little more about 
So it sounds like um, palliative care helps to think through all the different ways that somebody might need help. And so I wonder if palliative care has any kind of connection to care coordination and how they support coordinating all of that care that may be required. Yeah, um, that that is a lot of what we do is care coordination. Um, so if we're talking about care coordination in the hospital, um, what we do is we will often set up um, interdisciplinary meetings with the different doctors and different teams that are seeing a person so that we can all kind of be on the same page because it's it's kind of astonishing. You get you get a number of different doctors seeing one person and can come up with like several different plans. Um, so we coordinate care in that way. Um, we coordinate uh, the transition for um, from the hospital back to home or the hospital to skilled nursing, things like that. We help, we work with social workers and uh, those facilities to help make that transition as smooth as possible. And within like the clinic setting or the ambulatory setting, we um, will help coordinate uh, access to resources or referrals to things like uh, therapy, uh, counseling, support groups, uh, getting people in contact with DME providers and things like that. And then Thank we also you. are happy to talk to um, all other outpatient doctors as well if there's any questions that come up or, or need to coordinate medical plans. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibbons. Another question we had relates to comfort care. Um, does palliative care help in the case of folks who perhaps may decline certain kinds of care that might be uncomfortable? Uh, this particular person is asking about, you know, if you decline, for example, a feeding tube or certain kinds of breath and cough support, does palliative care play a role in facilitating comfort care in those cases? Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, a lot of our training is focused in um, doing both symptom management with aggressive measures and doing symptom management when the goal shifts to something more like comfort care. Um, and so that's part of why it's helpful to have us involved earlier, just in case, you know, there is that need for a shift in goals down the road. Um, we help with that transition and we absolutely can help with um, symptom management for, for, you know, shortness of breath and things like that. If patients don't want invasive ventilation, um, if people don't want feeding tubes, we can also have discussions and, about what that looks like and help navigate living with issues um, like swallowing issues without a feeding tube. Um, yeah, we absolutely help with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibbons. So you said in your presentation, one of the things you've learned in surveying individuals with neuromuscular disorders is that one of the causes of anxiety for folks is sort of not knowing what to expect in the future, and that one of the ways palliative care supports this is by facilitating conversations about future planning. Mm -hmm. I wonder yeah. if you could speak a little bit more about both how individuals with DM and their families could uh, initiate those kinds of conversations, uh, including if they do not have palliative care providers, and also how they uh, can work with palliative care to facilitate those conversations and talk with their families about those things too. Yeah, so um, that is such a good question. Um, and I, I think it's such an important thing to talk about. So, um, you know, I think it just really starts with broadly saying what is important to me. You know, what what is a what is a quality of life that is acceptable to me and what is a quality of life that is not acceptable to me? And then asking your doctor say, "Hey, I have talked to my family and I know that my quality of life would not be acceptable if I couldn't, let's say, communicate with people. What things do I need to be aware of medically?" that I might need to make a decision about that would impact that quality of life. So you have a specific goal of care, and then you can go to your doctor and ask your doctor, what, what kind of medical decisions might be pertinent to me if this is something that's important to me? Um, there's some tools online that are really helpful. Um, 
uh, five, five wishes, I believe is what it's called. Um, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a workbook that you go through and it asks, it prompts you to have some of those questions and, and it like, um, will encourage you to answer those questions in your own words and, um, talk to your family about some of those questions. That way, you know, you have kind of a basis for asking your doctor about the specific medical issues that you might need to talk about them with them in more detail. Um, if you can't find the five wishes, um, one specifically, um, just search for advanced directives and that will often lead you into, um, documents that prompt some of those discussions about quality of life and things that you would or would not want. Um, you know, I think, Specifically for my tonic dystrophy, um, you know, talking about a lot of folks who have heart issues with my tonic dystrophy, like talking through things like defibrillators and what do I do if I want it? What do I do if I get it and don't want one down the road? Um, feeding tubes are another one to really consider. Um, so is ventilatory support. Other things that I would say are important for DM is um uh, the, the surgery, because we know anesthesia is quite a, a big risk for DM, things like that. But I would start kind of broadly by thinking about what your goals are and what are some quality of life non-negotiables for you. And then that way you can kind of come to your doctor and team and ask about specific medical um, decisions that might apply to you. Dr. Gibbons, thank you so much. You have answered our questions. You've given us so much to think about, so much information, uh, so many ways to talk about difficult topics that make that a little bit easier. And we're so grateful. I wonder if you have some final thoughts or words for us. I I just really am so happy to have the opportunity to talk to you guys. I, I think that, um, it's such a wonderful thing to have a community of support like this. And I just really hope that in the future, um, palliative medicine can also be part of that community and, and grow um, to help support you all better. Um, and I just really thank you for taking some time to listen and, um, and talk with me. So yeah, thank you very much. Well, we are so grateful that you are here with us today, Dr. Gibbons. Um, everyone listening, Dr. Shauna Gibbons is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Palliative Medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Her incredible presentation and all the questions she answered today have been recorded for your future viewing and listening to learn and to grow in this information. We're grateful to Dr. Gibbons for being with us and for all of you for listening and engaging. And we hope that everyone uh, listening now has a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you all so much.